Thank you, and I am so happy to be here, and I'm so happy to finally be talking to people instead of my dog, because <laughs> I've been practicing this presentation, and so it's it's good to see live people, and I am excited to bring this news to you. Um, my name is Audrey Brower. I'm with Davidson & Associates Insurance. I've been with Davidson & Associates since 1995, um, been in the insurance industry since 1987. So I got my start with my mother and father-in-law's agency in Southern California. So I graduated college and they said, you come work for us. So I know a lot of people don't pick insurance. You just it kind of somehow find you. So my father-in-law found me. So I have been married to my husband, Pete, for 36 years in October. We have two children. Our daughter, Joanne, is 27. She works for a local financial advisory firm as a portfolio administrator. And our son, Sam, is 24, and he's in the construction industry. And so that's a little bit about uh, my personal life. So what I'll do is go through the agenda here quickly with you. So to give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about. So um, just a little bit of introduction on Davidson and Associates. We're a, a local community-minded agency. So as I mentioned, I've been there since 95 and Bruce Davidson started the agency. So it's been a great place to work and, and it is a community-minded company, much like Heidi's firm here. And so we welcome the opportunity to talk to people. And again, it's great to be here. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is some of the basics of homeowners and automobile insurance. So I wanted to go through these for you. And for some of you, this might be a review, but I think it's good for everybody to get a review. And so I'm going to dive a little bit deep, not too deep, but a little bit deep into some of the important aspects of the automobile insurance policy and the homeowners insurance policy. And I'll also talk about the umbrella, the flood, and the earthquake. And then we'll get to that famous topic that everybody's been asking about, why are my insurance rates going up? And then we'll talk about how we can lower those rates on both home and auto. And then I have some brief information about water damage claims and something that I call your homework. So something I think that you all should be able to take some valuable information back to your homes and use in review of your own personal insurance program. So let's get started on automobile insurance. So the, there's so many people that contact me and they say, um, I want a full coverage auto policy. Well, what is a full coverage auto policy? So to me, a full, a full auto policy includes six main components. So the first main component that we come up to to is the bodily injury limit of liability and the property damage liability. So that's protection in the event that you're responsible for causing bodily injury to someone or damaging their property in your use of an auto. So most often the limits of liability on an auto policy commonly you'll see are the 100,000 per person, 300,000 per accident for bodily injury and 100,000 per property damage. So what does that mean? So there's limitations in a split limit coverage form. 100,000 is the most they'll pay per person in that bodily injury in that auto accident. And then your maximum that they'll pay for all the bodily injuries, 300,000. And then you have a sublimit for property damage. So property damage liability is you damage someone else's property when your use of a car, whether it was their car, their fence, a building, whatever it was of someone else's owned property that you damaged. So that's a split limit of liability, but then we also have combined single limit. This is broader coverage, and this is a coverage I would counsel and recommend you have, because this is basically a bucket of dollars. They'll say 300,000 or 500,000 liability limit, and there isn't that limitation of how much they'll pay per person for that bodily injury, or a limitation on how much property damage they'll pay out. They'll say, here's 300,000 or 500,000, whatever you purchase, and that's your bucket of dollars for each single loss. Heidi. Uh, typical amount purchased, but more importantly, a typical amount actually paid. Could you say that again? Do you see a typical amount um, purchased, or do you see a typical amount claims in claims and actually used? Like, do you usually suggest three or five hundred? Yes. Well, we typically counsel 300 or 500,000. Um, our, our goal is to ensure that we properly protect your assets in the event of a significant loss. So, you know, 
The way we do that is through buying higher limits of coverage. And, but most of the public, you know, as much as we try to explain to them that the state minimum of 2550 is not adequate because you're not protecting yourself well either, you're putting your own assets on the line. Um, our counsel is to buy higher, 300 or 500. But most of the public that will come to us, they're looking for the split limit because it is a little bit less and they're trying to just, you know, get what's adequate. So they'll hear my counsel, but ultimately they're going to end up, you know, purchasing what they select. But most definitely 300 or 500,000 in single limit is counsel. So the second aspect is personal injury protection. So this is no fault medical payments coverage. So this is coverage for you and any passenger in your auto and when you're involved in an accident. And let's say that company A hasn't decided if you were at fault, company B hasn't decided if the other guy was at fault, but you've got someone who's injured, either yourself or one of your passengers in your car. Personal injury protection allows you the opportunity to seek immediate medical attention. And so while the insurance companies are deciding who's going to pay the rest of the bills, you at least have something to offer either for yourself to go or for a passenger in your auto. They typically start at $10,000 for PIP, then the next level is $35,000 and then $50,000. So uh, there are folks that say, well, I've got great health insurance, so I don't need personal injury protection. Fair. You know, if you want to, you know, use your health insurance, you can do that. My counsel, too, again, is why not have that coverage available to you for immediate attention, uh, medical attention. It's also good because it's available for you for aftercare. So let's say the accidents happened, you're going through and you're discovering that you need to seek some additional care, chiropractic care, um, additional physical therapy as a result of that accident. We have so many examples within our office of folks who um say they were so grateful that we encouraged them to keep the PIP coverage. Even though it cost you a little bit of money, it, it definitely came in as a benefit. Yes, you have your health insurance, but don't forget about PIP and PIP applies to anybody in your car. So, and then again, the limit is 10,000, but it's per person. So if you have four people in your car, the policy could potentially pay out 40,000 if you all maxed out your medical coverage. So the next uh, key component is uninsured motorist bodily injury and property damage. So in the first part, when we talked about bodily injury, that's coverage when you're responsible for causing bodily injury. Uninsured motorist coverage is when someone else is responsible for hitting you with a car and they cause you bodily injury or damage your auto. So um, uninsured motorist coverage allows you the opportunity to have coverage in the event that someone either has the state limit of 25,000 per person, 50,000 per accident. So they're legally driving, but they cause you bodily injury that's greater than the limits they have. You can seek coverage for yourself under your own automobile insurance policy. So that is key because it also applies if you were a pedestrian on the street, if you're riding a scooter, you have a college student out riding a skateboard on campus and someone hits them when they go through the crosswalk. These are all examples of things that have occurred at the agency in my time there. And um, uninsured motorist is a key component to remember that you have that coverage for yourself. And typically when you write auto insurance, you're writing the same uninsured motorist bodily injury as you have for your liability portion of the policy. So uninsured motorist property damage, that's coverage for your car if your car gets hit by an unknown. Most commonly you see this, your car is parked in the Fred Meyer parking lot, someone dinged your door and they didn't leave their name. And so now you've got to fix your car. Uninsured motorist property damage has a lower collision deductible than the tip of a $5,000 collision deductible. And then some policies actually will go ahead and waive that deductible. So that's all company specific though. So next component is physical damage. So that's coverage for your car if it's damaged in a claim. There's two, two parts of this. There's the comprehensive coverage right here on the bottom. Comprehensive is coverage for damage to your car from fire, theft, vandalism, flood, glass repair, replacement, objects that fall on your car, whether it's a tree branch, hail damage, 
Um, and also hitting an animal with your car. That's actually falls under the comprehensive deductible. Um, most folks have probably a $250 deductible, $500 deductible for comprehensive. The rate for that's gonna be varied by, you know, how valuable is your car? So your comp deductible is pretty inexpensive, as is your collision if you've got a, you know, car worth 10,000 versus a car worth 100,000. So, but again, this is a important component. And, it's always important, I think, to continue to keep comprehensive, even if you don't need collision, because if your vehicle is stolen, which we have a lot of happening around here, at least you have something, even if it's only worth $2,000, at least you have something rather than nothing. So, and again, I imagine everybody knows what a deductible is. That's your portion of the loss that you're gonna pay. Um, the company will pay less your deductible for that cost, so. Okay, and then the last two are optional, but they are a part of it. Rental reimbursement coverage, your car is damaged in an accident and you need a substitute vehicle while your vehicle is being repaired. So that's available for you typically $50 a day. They usually go 30 days. Um, nowadays, we're finding things are running a little bit shy on that because it's taking a lot longer for cars to be repaired. So be aware of that, but this is coverage for you if your, your car is damaged. Typically, if the other guy's at fault, they're they're going to pay and you don't have to worry about because the other guy, if they're liable, they're liable for the property damage to cause to you, right? And so they're going to, their policy is going to pay for it. So you don't need it in that case. Um, and then finally, roadside assistance. So that's towing, fluid delivery, that sort of thing. So any... The required Required ones, believe it or not, is just bodily injury liability, the very first component. You can waive personal injury protection. You can reject uninsured motorists, and you don't have to choose the rest. So to be legal, you just need the first one. But and I think the minimums are lower, they're like just bare minimum. Yeah, the bare, the, the, yes, the state minimum for coverage for bodily or for bodily injury in the state of Washington is 25000 per person. 50,000 per accident. And the property damage limit is 10,000. So you can be legal out there, but really doesn't go far, you know, because there's a lot of cars worth more than 10,000 on the road. Um, even at 100,000, I mean, I have, a, I have a landscaper in our neighborhood. He bought a new pickup, $100,000 pickup. So you get in a collision or a couple car collision, you can eat through your liability limit really quick. If you get hit by someone who has such minimum insurance, um, then does your insurance kick in after that? Yeah, so if, if there's bodily insurance. injury, if there's bodily injury, yes, then you can go take some coverage from your uninsured motorist um, coverage. So that's the key component on that, too, is to have that matching. You want to have adequate coverage because you're protecting yourself or your passengers um, in that area. So, Rachel, did you have a question? Yeah. Yes. So if on your policy it says accepted or option A, something on that order, that means that's the basic initial limit of 10,000. If it says like option B, that's your next tick to 35,000. So yes, if it says accepted, that means he has the state basic of 10,000. So I thought I would go through a claim with you. Um, hopefully there's time for this, but I think it helps put the concepts together and helps you understand how it works. And then also I wanted to let you know that this is a payday presentation. So a payday presentation means participation gains you a payday. So I welcome you to talk through this and I'm gonna read through this um, next screen and you can see it for yourself. So we're going to take the, the story and we're going to apply it to coverage so that we can kind of get an idea of how this all works together. So um, here we go. And remember, payday, participate, please. I don't want to be the only one talking. So um, Ed was sitting, and this is a true example, by the way, the names have been changed. Ed was sitting on Highway 14 westbound in stop and go traffic, waiting to go southbound on I-5 right here. 
John was distracted. He didn't notice traffic had stopped in front of him and John was driving a large Chevy pickup truck. Ed's vehicle is damaged. Ed, Ed's vehicle had a $20,000 damage to it and it was totaled. Ed suffered significant injury, keeping him in the hospital for six months. Ed's injuries were $350,000. John suffered bodily injury also, $8,000, and his vehicle's repair were $18,000. John's coverage limits, so this John's the guy that rear-ended Ed, had $100,000 per person, $300,000 per accident, $100,000 in property damage. Ed had a $500,000 combined single limit policy. And what's missing on here, I apologize, is that he also had uninsured motorist bodily injury of 500,000. So both of them had personal injury protection and they both had the same comprehensive and collision deductible. Okay, so are you ready for your quiz? How much did John's policy pay for Ed's injury? 300 per accident. You said it's 100,000 per person. So how much did John's policy pay for Ed's bodily injury? I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you one for talking and participating. Okay. That was injured. So, and again, because John's at fault, his policy is paying for Ed's injury because he called bodily injury to them. So, would John have any coverage for his medical injuries of 8,000 on his policy? And where would he get the coverage? Yep, you're right. Personal injury protection because that's coverage for him. Remember the liability portion on our policy isn't coverage for you. It's coverage for damn injury that you caused someone else. So if you need some medical coverage immediately, from, I'll save this one for you for the next time. Okay. So, all right. So uh, how much did John's policy pay for Ed's vehicle? So remember the property damage limit. So how much was John's damage? Correct, correct, correct. And how much did John's policy pay for John's pickup truck that was damaged? How much? So John's pickup, how much did John's policy pay for the damage to his truck? And his, correct. Right. 17.5. Yeah. <laughs> so I know I look at this all day, every day, but you know, I mean, it's, it's, I'm trying to just help you understand how it works and where, who gets the deductible applied and where does coverage come into play? So, sure, sure, sure. All right, and then just one final question, and I think we kind of talked about that. Does anybody see where Ed could get some additional coverage for his bodily injury? Correct. Uninsured motorist bodily injury. So, so John's policy paid 100,000 for Ed's injury, and then um, Ed was able to access another 250,000 from his own uninsured motorist bodily injury. So another key component on why you want to have higher limits of coverage, because sometimes you might need it for yourself. Um, there would probably be a situation perhaps where they had to, you know, file a suit for the remainder against that person. So that's the that's the challenge, yes. So if he didn't have enough to pay for all the injury, even from access of his uninsured motorist coverage, then he either has to seek legal counsel um, or hope his medical health insurance took place. 
Um, fortunately, in this situation, there was enough coverage, but that's another key that I'm going to come to later when we talk about the umbrella policy. Because the umbrella policy has the ability for you to buy additional uninsured motorist bodily injury. And it's a key component for Tony and Bryce and for our agency because we've had, unfortunately, several clients who were permanently injured as a result of an automobile accident. And um, that additional coverage was necessary. Uh, there was a young woman who was 27, suffered brain shear because she was broadsided. She was a passenger in a car. She had a young daughter and um, she healed physically, but unfortunately her mind, she could no longer take care of herself or her daughter. And so her parents ended up um, using the benefit from the policy to take care of their daughter and their granddaughter. So um, anyway, that, that was a sad, sad circumstance. Um, and so oftentimes people say, I don't need it. We have enough in our agency where we did. So, Rachel? Drawing from uninsured motorists is typically considered a not at fault incident and for the most part is not punitive. They will, the, the insurance rating is complicated and it has a weighty scale. So anything, you know, the worse the situation, the higher the scale. So, you know, um, speeding over 25 carries a high weight at fault accidents. Comprehensive claims are very light on the scale. An uninsured motorist, most carriers do not consider it punitive. So no, you weren't at fault in the situation. So they're not gonna be punitive to you in that regard. Okay, any questions on the auto policy? I'm gonna to have to step it up a bit to <laughs> get through this material. So any questions on the automobile? No, okay. So next part is the homeowner's insurance policy. So I would like you to think of a homeowner's policy as a skeleton, okay? No homeowner's policy is the same. This is the most varied product that we see. Um, there are so many different companies out there offering homeowners insurance. And so you can be buying a skeleton or you can be buying a fleshed out policy. And so what I'm gonna share with you is what's the skeleton that typically about everybody is for certain to have, and then the ways to build up your homeowners policy so you feel that you're adequately insured for your home. So the first thing we wanna make sure of is that your home is um, insured for the right replacement cost. So definitely be sure that your home is kept up to date. Typically homeowners policies have an inflation cost guide to them. And so they do tick up on renewal. You may have noticed that on your dwelling limit, but anytime you're doing work on your home, you do definitely wanna make sure um, that your replacement cost guide is staying up with the times. So we're seeing a lot of homeowners carriers now increasing the property deduct or the property limit by 10%. 13% or 15%, because we have such a higher bottle uh, building costs, they've got to keep the home to the adequate amount of coverage. So that's a key component to be sure of. So okay, I'm gonna slow you down, but uh, so I bought my house, let's say I bought it for 10 grand, and because of how the market goes, it's now worth, let's say 350, just make it. So, does my insurance only cover me at 100 grand because that's what I started at? Do I need to call and get it up or is it automatically? Okay. So um, his question is if he bought his home and it would, the value of his home on the dwelling was 100,000 and it's now worth 350,000, do I need to uh, contact my agent? Yes. Um, but I would likely assume that you've got a cost guide inflation built in, but you do definitely want to be in touch with your agent on a yearly basis to go through these things because sometimes the inflation guard doesn't keep pace with um, what's happening in the community in regards to the cost of building materials. So that's one of my takeaway points for you is to just ensure that you talk to your agent every year do a review and make sure that your home is adequately insured. And But, you know, remember, too, that on your homeowner's insurance, a part of the value of your house includes the land, but we don't ever insure the land because that's not going to go away. And then a part of the cost or the value of your house, if you're looking at it in a, in a real estate fashion, 
auction, let's put it that way. The market determines some of that cost, um, the um, likability of where your property is will increase your cost. So the, you wanna stick to is the bones correct. And so your agent's your best source because we have tools that we use that are in, industry wide to help us determine what's the true replacement cost for your home based on its characteristics. So your build size, that sort of thing. So the main structure skeletons of your policy, these are the ones that are included on every homeowner's policy. So coverage A is coverage. I'm sorry. Did you mention replacement costs? So how for that annual conversation period we could bring the Perfect. Yes. So um, this gentleman's question is to at your meeting with your insurance advisor, is that the right time to go through your replacement cost guide to be ensure that everything is correct? Did I hear you correctly? Yeah, I did. And I guess you have a recommendation, but how do we really provide a replacement cost? It's going to be different than just a, a, you know, a red thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So the way we, we arrive at that replacement cost is through the internal tools that are a part of the insurance rating programs. So they all have basically two different programs that are used, but they're very synonymous and they require us to, so for example, as a new client, go through all those characteristics, square footage of your house, the quality of the materials. I'll ask you questions like what percentage is carpet versus linoleum? What kind of surfaces do you have in your home? You know, how old is your roof? And so at the beginning is when you go through and really get down to the, you know, what is the replacement cost guide? And then on your annual review, if you said I updated my kitchen and I changed my materials, then we go through that guide again. And the guide is, is updated all the time to stay with current times. And it's again, based on where you live too. So. The replacement cost guide here is different than the replacement cost guide in Iowa. You know, so it, it's indicative of where you are. What if, what if your house is worth for where it is today, $400,000, but if it burned down, you would want to rebuild it and pay 600,000. So you insure it for 600,000. Will the insurance company pay for the upgraded house because you insured it for that additional amount? So I think what you're saying and what I can apply to in this extended replacement cost feature. So you have a house that's worth 400,000. It's had total fire happens. And now the cost to rebuild it is 600,000. Well, no, let's say it's 6,000, but you <laughs> Okay. You'll have to pay that the difference. So they're not going to give you, they're not going to give you the upgrades. You can pay the upgrades. Even though you weren't sure. Because the, the policy is going to say, we're going to put you back to the way you were at the time of the loss. Yeah. So, you know, if you had, you know, this carpet finish and this kitchen finish, then the policy is going to pay based on how much it costs for those finishes once again. But if you want to update it, you can and you can pay that difference. Um, you can't say that it's done. Well, you, <laughs> if you want to insure it for greater, um, you can. Some carriers say that's excessive. Why are you trying to over-insure your property? Some, property? some companies will say, yeah, go ahead. You want to pay the premium, you can. But one of the key aspects on my next page is an endorsement called extended replacement costs. So our house is worth 400000 but we've got an endorsement on there that allows for that fluctuation possibly in you know, the cost of building materials and labor. And typically that percentage is like another 25% or another 50% of your dwelling limit. So that's our cushion in the event that building materials cost more, labor costs more. But if you um, just have a feeling, you know, you want to insure it for more than the guide says, and sometimes I'll give it a little extra because it's not a, it's, it's as close a tool as you can get, but it's super hard to get to every single detail then I'll, I'll give it a little nudge up. I'd rather nudge up because the difference in cost is and 
that great. But I typically, when I give a proposal and I show you your home replacement cost, I give you those details. And I say, would you please review these details and let me know if I'm off anywhere? Did I miss something? Do you have something nicer that I omitted? Or did I, was I excessive? So I want you to see what the replacement cost guide says. So I'm gonna show it to you and it will ensure that we're on the same page with where, what the features are. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go through the skeleton pieces, the main parts of the homeowner's policy. So coverage A is gonna be your dwelling limit. That's the bones of the house. And then coverage B is your detached structures. So that's your fence, your shed, an ADU unit, which is very popular now. Um, water features um, in the yard, gazebos, anything like that that's considered a detached structure. That's coverage B. Then you have coverage C, which is all your personal belongings. So whatever is not affixed to the house, those are considered personal belongings. So artwork, clothing, furniture, anything that's not affixed is a personal contact. Additional living expenses is coverage D. That's always a part of the policy as well. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, that is coverage in the event that you have a covered loss at your home and you can't live in your home. And so you, you need to go live elsewhere. So you need to go live in a residence inn for a couple months. My coworker, Sherry, had this happen to her. She was out of her house for 10 months. And um, this additional living expense paid for her additional costs. Her family was away from home um, at work and her daughter was at school. The upstairs bathroom um, faucet line from the wall to the toilet burst and the water was running from the upstairs all the way down to the downstairs for a good part of the day while they were away. And so she came home to a flooded house and a damaged home. She couldn't live there. So additional living expenses, which is coverage D, paid for the additional expense that she had as a result of that covered loss. A part of me. The coverage D is typically a static limit on your policy. Some companies let you adjust it, but typically it's either 25% or 30% of what your dwelling limit is. Okay. And personal liability then is um, you cause bodily injury to someone or you damage someone's stuff or you use words to offend other than using an auto. So one key component about personal liability on the homeowner's policy it is not restricted to just on your residence premise. It's wherever you go, whatever you do. So you're um, on vacation and you walk out of a cafe, you open the door quickly and you turn to the left and you, you knock over a person and they suffer bodily injury. They break their hip. Where can you get coverage for the injury that you caused to them? From your homeowner's policy because you caused bodily injury. Um, damage someone's property. Uh, you go to your neighbor who has an antique dining room table, $7,000 table, lovely table. She serves you a glass of lemonade and she wants to show you her vacation photos. You reach to look at her phone. You knock the lemonade over. You ruin the finish on the antique table. Where can you get coverage for the cost to replace that table? Your homeowner's policy. So remember that it's not restricted to your property. It's wherever you go and whatever you're doing, if you cause bodily injuries, someone damage their stuff. So, and then libel and slander, of course, is also a part of personal liability coverage. So using words to offend, whether written or spoken. And then the last piece is medical expenses. This is gratuitous medical coverage. This is, um, you know, uh, someone's injured on your property, you weren't responsible for the loss, but you feel benevolent towards them. So an example, grandma had a grandson visiting, he was running through her house, he tripped and fell, hit his chin on her coffee table and needed stitches in his chin. She had medical coverage from her homeowner's policy to her grandson's medical injury. She had no responsibility for him falling, it's just something that happened. That's what that's there for. That's typically maxed at five or 10,000, but it is available. Um, can you also get uh, like replacement uh, income if you were renting like part of your house on an Airbnb as Airbnb or something like that? Yes, you can. So additional living expense on the home is, you know, you can't be in your home, but 
if you had a landlord policy, that coverage D is there too, and that's loss of income. So if I'm understanding your question right, yeah, if there's a loss at your rental property or a portion of your house and your tenant can't be there because of that covered loss, covered loss, that's a key component, then coverage D extends also to loss of rents or loss of use. So for coverage D, you had, part of your answer was is a dwelling limit of 25%. I'm sure that you know what that means. So let's say your dwelling limit, so that's your coverage A. Okay. Dwelling limit is through your home. The cost to replace your home. Oh. Okay. okay. So let's say your home, the cost to rebuild it, the coverage limit that we have is 500000 Okay. Coverage D, additional living expense, is always going to be typically 25% of that coverage A, your dwelling limit. Okay. Sorry, thank you for asking that question. So 125,000 would be right. your addition. You. Expense. Okay. So we talked a little bit about this uh, next endorsement, extended replacement costs. That's how we build in that cushion to ensure that um, when we've got your home at what we think is a replacement cost guide, if we need some uh, additional uh, cushion factor, it's typically 25% or 50%. I typically write 50%. If I can get 100%, I do. Um, I would rather be safe than sorry when it comes to insuring your home because you just don't know what the costs are. And so those are options to ensure that your home does indeed get rebuilt. This next aspect is probably one of the most important ones because we don't know. There's two ways that you can have coverage on your homeowner's policy. It's either a named peril policy or an open peril policy. This is a key one, okay? So if you have a named peril policy, that means that if you, your cause of loss had better be one of these things written right here. So if it's not a fire, a lightning, wind, explosion, vandalism, damage from a plane or a car, theft, falling objects, weight of snow and ice, or water damage, if that's not, if, if you have a name peril policy, those are the only things that are gonna be covered if you have a claim, okay? And if you have an open peril policy, it's a better policy because what the open policy our policy says is we're going to provide coverage for any loss that you claim on your homeowner's policy unless it's excluded. So I'd rather take my exclusions, which is much smaller. You know, my cause of loss is that are excluded are earthquake, flood, landslide, wear and tear, and maintenance issues. So that opens up your opportunity for the insurance company to say, yes, we have coverage for you as opposed to having a name peril policy where it's specific. You can only have this cause of loss. So I'll give you an example. So you tell me if this would fit under a named peril policy or not. A sudden burst pipe in your home. Is that gonna be covered under name peril? Okay. All right, so here's my funny one that's part of the agency, okay? Uh, Pinky the Poodle is trotting around through the house. And Mary has painted her guest room and she left the paint pan on the floor. Pinky Poodle walked through the paint pan and then put her paw prints all through the carpeting on the lower level of the house. This is a true claim. She called and said, I need help. I've got a claim to file. Now, if she'd had a name peril policy, nowhere in there does it say Pinky Poodle walking paint around the carpeting. You know, so... Um, again, it sounds up, it sounds unusual. They sound like silly claims, but these are truly things that happen to people. And they call us and they say, do I have coverage for this? And the worst thing to say is, sorry, no coverage. We, we hate it, you know, because it's just, you're like, ah, you know, I mean, the, we do our best to cover everything. But, you know, so we ensure that we're writing open peril policies because name peril is going to be very restricted. Okay. It's still going to cover you for some of the big things. But those weird things like Pinky the Poodle, there's not going to be covered. Water damage. Okay. So flood is um, a different peril. And that's the definition of that is a sudden flow of water over the surface of the ground where it normally should be dry outside. Okay. So, so an overflowing river. Um, floods the surface of the road and goes into your home. Water damage is inside your home and it has to be sudden. 
Okay, I will talk about that a little bit later, but sudden. So typically your burst pipe, um, your water line from your refrigerator that became dislodged, you know, something like that. That's what's water damage. I'm talking about interior, interior water damage. Okay. Any questions about that? The typical exclusion is roof. What about fire damage that is caused? Well, that's like the one caveat of, like of natural gas line that's the one exploded. caveat. Yes. So actually, that's interesting because what this is something that we learn. If there's a, if there's an earthquake or a flood, you better hope a fire starts because <laughs> the policy is always going to pay when there's a fire as a result. So that's the one little nuance in insurance. So you get your spot on on that. So hope that there's a fire if, if during the or during an earthquake if you don't have coverage. So. Okay, now I'm going to talk quickly about the muscles. And am I okay? I know I'm already at my time, but I, are we all right, everyone? Okay, I'm not boring you to death. Okay, all right. So now I'm going to talk about the muscles. So we talked about our skeleton. Now I want to talk about the muscles. Now, this is really how you build out your homeowner's policy to ensure that you're covered properly. Personal replacement costs, I think most every policy has that. That's coverage. Um, to replace your personal property without depreciation. Um, I would hope that everyone has that. But these now next items are endorsements that you can add to your policy to ensure that you get coverage. So backup of sewer and drain is pretty much self-descriptive, self uh, covers damage to your home or your flooring as a result of a backup of sewage or other water in your house. Hidden water damage is my favorite one. Um, this one is relatively new, just came out about four years ago. Prior to this endorsement, if you had any seeping of water, so long-standing leaking water happening in your house, um, that was always excluded because again, it has to be a sudden water event for it to be covered on your homeowner's policy. And this happened so often um, and it was discouraging. Uh, we were just so tired of telling people that, sorry, there's no coverage for that because it was a slow seep. And they would say, I don't know. I didn't even know anything was happening. I didn't see behind my shower panel that, you know, my shower tile was loose and there was black mold behind there until it finally deteriorated. Well, unfortunately, that had been going on. Yes, you didn't know. But unfortunately, there's no coverage. So this endorsement is key. If you have the opportunity to add hidden water damage to your homeowner's policy, please, please, please add it. It's $50 a year, if that, and it will save you a ton of heartache. I had um, good friends of mine who had a home in Philida. They had a split level home. This was before the endorsement. And they had two young teenage sons. And so they had a rec room in the lower area of their home. And they had like a mini bar and they had a pool table and a card table and that kind of thing. And so that was used frequently by the boys when they were home. The boys grew, left the home, and Dave and Kathy didn't go down in that lower level much anymore. They didn't care to use the uh, pool table and that kind of thing. Dave decided he needed to go down and, and check on something behind the mini bar. He walked into the lower level, and he squished, and he squished, and his socks were soaking wet. And so he goes, and he, he calls a water remediation company right away. They come out, they pull up the carpet, it's black as night underneath, and it's, it's the, the subfloor is black. And they call me and they you know, say, oh, we had this happen, do I have any coverage? No, sorry. You know, these are good friends of mine. That's, that's even, even harder, you know? I mean, it's hard regardless, but you know, to look them in the eye and say, sorry, there's no coverage for that. And they're like, how would we know? And you know, it's like, you know, the leak probably came from some kind of line behind a refrigerator in the bar, in the mini bar area there. So just an unused portion of the house because of circumstance and all of a sudden they've got a, a significant loss that's not covered. So please, please, if you have the opportunity to add this one, if you take anything from this, higher liability limits and hidden water damage because it happens, it happens. Service line repair, this is coverage to repair to service the exterior lines that service your home. So think of your water lines, your gas lines, um, sewer lines, and so your water downspout. I'm your example for service line repair, okay? Um, springtime, I'm walking outside my home. I go to the backyard and I notice a bunch of water pooling at the foundation of my house. 
And so I called my husband, Pete, Pete you got to come out here. I got a bunch of water on the side of, our, side of the house here. So he comes out there and he goes, I know a guy. You have to know my husband. I know a guy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so he calls a guy, comes out, and, and Judy knows my husband. So he goes out and he digs up the side. And, you know, on the downspout, when the rain comes down, it usually comes down the spout and then there's an elbow. And then it, it's underneath your driveway and it heads out to the street. Okay, well, my elbow came loose. And so what was happening was during the springtime, the water was just running down into the dirt. And so that was the pooling of water. So service line repair would be that option that would fix that if you didn't know a guy or you weren't handy, you know, but, it, but you know, that, that's the purpose of that, that endorsement. So fixing those things that happen when you have failure of the lines that service your house on the outside. A sprinkler system, that could be a possibility, yeah. There's damage to that because it even looks at wear and tear. So depending, it could be a possibility if there's a damage to that, if they find what caused it, whether it's wear and tear or whether it's root system or something like that. Um, you know, that's that could be. Equipment breakdown, I would call that basically um, a home warranty program. Um, it provides you with coverage if you have mechanical failure to things like heating and air conditioning systems, your computers, your appliances, and that kind of thing. So it's about a $24 endorsement. Um, it's optional, but you know, it's available there. We had a client who had um, both his heating and air conditioning system and his refrigerator replaced. I came out to his house for a completely different reason. He was, wanted me to look at a beam in his house because there was um, dry rot. And he said, by the way, you were telling me about that, that equipment breakdown coverage. Um, I need to file a claim. And they had a claim. They, they paid for the repair to his heating and air conditioning system. Frog got in the panel and blew the panel. Believe it or not, the frog was found. Um, and then the other portion was he had a, a really nice refrigerator in his, he had a nice home, really nice refrigerator. And the, the panel um, quit working where you push to get your ice water and they replaced his refrigerator because that part was no longer available. So you can talk about I'm going to get to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on homeowners insurance, how we can build up our policy? Okay. So we're going to go to umbrella coverage. So what umbrella coverage does is it provides you with that additional layer of liability coverage that comes over your auto policy or your homeowner's policy in the event. So what you're protecting yourself from is a serious judgment, you know, the serious auto accident, you know, or somehow or another you are brought to lawsuit and it's a serious judgment. So umbrella policies are fairly inexpensive. Um, I think they're kind of equated to one hour's time with an attorney, you know, 200, your typical family with a one home, two cars, and it's going to be about $200, $250 a year. So that's pretty inexpensive coverage to give you another million dollars in protection. So it's covering you for that really significant event that could happen. So uh, here are some examples of folks I think that should definitely consider owning one. And that would be folks that own an animal. I have a dog, Jordy, and he's a miniature schnauzer, and I would call him kind of a land shark. I mean, it was he, <laughs> very protective and he would he would dash at people as a puppy. And I was just like, oh, my, you know, I'm going to be my own example again for insurance because, you know, dogs do that. Dogs may they, they may not even bite. They may even just run out to the street and startle someone. So if you got an animal, you should consider one. If you have a swimming pool, you should consider one. Um, I think that's evident why. Um, unfortunately, that's. Also something that has occurred um, if you're a landlord or you have rental dwellings. So um, your exposure is greater in that regard because you have a tenant that could sue you. And then you also have guests of the tenant that could sue you for some reason. You know, you, your tenant did this or you didn't fix that on the sidewalk. You left this, you left the hose. It's a litigious society. And so if you have rental properties, please, please be sure that you've included an umbrella as part of your protection. Teenage drivers, um, yeah, it's good to protect yourself just in case. 
you know, we'd like to all think our kids are good drivers, but the statistics bear, bear the stuff happens. So um, injury and recreation. So if you're a boater, you like to water ski, um, that's another opportunity where unfortunately things can happen. You know, a water skier is injured while you're pulling them. You hit a water skier, you hit another boat. Um, just be aware that your recreation can have a liability a component to it. So, and then of course, libel and slander. If you've got somebody that's active on social media, um, think of think of the young person that's writing something on, on uh, Instagram or Facebook or whatever that's bullying in nature. I'm not trying to express that anyone has a child that does that, but these are things that come up. Um, social media has become a place for folks to... Um, yeah. Regarding social media, you've got a, a child that's in college. They're not under your roof anymore. Would an umbrella extend to their slander defamation? If you were, if you were still basically supporting them, so you know you're paying their tuition and they're still, you know, under your automobile policy, and under, you know, considered still a household member, even though they're away at school. Yes, it would. So the umbrella coverage, how much do I need? Well, your first person to talk to is Heidi because mm -hmm. our financial and her team. Um, we want you to counsel with your financial advisor. They have the best bead on what assets you need to protect and what you have going on. And then go to your insurance advisor and say, I've talked to my financial advisor. This is what she wants me to protect. Talk to your insurance advisor, even loop in Heidi um, in the conversation so that you can talk about that together. But um, it's important to use your advisors as a point of contact to help you learn how much to purchase. So um, we talked a little bit about excess uninsured motors bodily injury. I just want you to know, we talked about that serious auto accident where you need to access coverage from your own auto policy. You can buy an endorsement on your umbrella that buys you another million in coverage and more if you need um, under your umbrella policy. Uh, so be aware that that is something that you can purchase. Um, and then, of course, you do have to have a minimum auto bodily injury liability limit of $250,000 per person, $500,000 per accident to qualify for an umbrella. Any questions on umbrella? And, um, your auto and home through two different uh, insurance carriers, could you still get an umbrella from one of them? Um, yes, you can. So if you have your auto insurance and your homeowner's insurance with different carriers, typically, depending on the carrier, you would need to let the umbrella policy follow the auto. Okay, so a lot of companies say, if you want to buy an umbrella from me, you need to have your auto policy with me. Okay, in the home, you just have to make sure that your liability limit with the other company is of an added, you know, meets their minimum standard. Um, there also are some companies that are very restrictive and they say you have to have your home and your auto with me to, for me to give you an umbrella. So it's very company specific. And then of course, uh, there's also companies that are standalone umbrella carriers that are outside of your home and auto carrier. So there's a few different ways to accomplish that, but typically the auto has to belong to get the umbrella with that same carrier. Okay. So some of the higher echelon companies like Chubb, Nationwide Private Client, they will allow for a homeowner's policy and an umbrella policy, but your main street home and auto policies require the auto. Okay, now I'm gonna go quickly here through these two things, which is flood and earthquake. And please contact me if you'd like to have further information because these are seminars in themselves. And so I'm not gonna dig very deep into this, but I do wanna to touch on it. So flood insurance. I think, mean, does anybody recognize that photo where that's located? February of 1996, just down the way over here. So um, this, of course, folks that were living along the river here, the Husong and Larry's remember flooded and a lot of these buildings here. Pardon? And, yeah, so they obviously, I would hope, had flood insurance because of their proximity to the river. But 
what my key points on flood insurance is, is just be aware that you could be at risk, okay? So I don't know if you saw on the news the other day in Sunnyside Road flooded with that big hail and water came down. Now that was a bunch of water flowing over the surface of the ground, which is normally dry. It's a definition of flood. So could that overflow of water have flushed into somebody who had a basement and washed through the windows and gotten into their basement? If they wanted to file a claim on their homeowners and if they did not have flood insurance, that would be considered a flood. So be aware, well, I, we know about the folks that are right on the water, but there are instances of flood when you're not on the water. And I'll show you a property address here um, in Vancouver that's not close to the water and required flood insurance. So again, anywhere it rains, it can flood and it doesn't take much to cause damage. And I believe we established there is no coverage under your homeowner's policy policy for flood, okay? Here's the, the National Flood Insurance Program's definition of a flood. I'm gonna make it a lot easier than what I just said. A sudden overflow of water over the surface of the ground on land that is normally dry. So this can be you know, an overflow of inland waters. It can be an unusual rapid accumulation of water like I just spoke about in Sunnyside Road. It can also be a burst fire hydrant. A gentleman in Portland, fire hydrant up on the street. His house is down at the lower part of the street. A uh, fire hydrant burst. Water is just flowing down the street from the fire hydrant and it goes into his basement. That's a flood. So yeah, he could go back to the utilities or the city and perhaps claim for it. I don't know how long that would take, you know. And I know he probably is not thinking about it, but if you have a basement because that's you're going to have water that's going to have access to a lower level from the ground. Consider it. You can buy a flood policy for about five hundred fifty dollars a year when you're not in a flood zone and give you some give yourself some protection. Um, so be aware that that's available for you. You don't have to be, you know, you can buy the policy and you can protect yourself. Particularly again, if you had a basement. Okay, I'm going to go quickly through some misconceptions. We already established this. Um, it's not covered under the homeowner's policy. And some people think that um, flood assistance is going to uh, cover them if there's a flood. Well, it has to be declared a disaster by FEMA. So our, our examples of the, you know, the people locally here um, or the fellow with the fire hydrant, that's not going to be a FEMA disaster. So, you know, you shouldn't assume that the, the, the government's going to take care of you in that regard because it's going to be considered a significant event. So flood insurance can be bought in two ways. You can buy it through the federal or the, the national flood insurance program. That is indeed a static rate. It's the same for everyone. As long as your flood zone is the same, it's the same price. So, but the limit on the national flood insurance program is 250,000 in coverage on your structure and 100,000 contents, can't get any more. So if you have a million dollar home, um, the max you're gonna get is 250,000. However, you can buy insurance through private insurance. Private insurance does not have the same rate. That's just like auto and homeowners insurance. You can go to A and get one rate, go to B and get one rate, go to C and get another rate. So uh, the nice thing about private is you can insure yourself adequately if you've got a nicer house and you can just shop around for the rate. Um, so you have two options there with flood insurance. Okay, and then uh, finally, you know, I'm miles away from flood. How can I have a flood? This house is located uh, south of the Padden Parkway on the east side of the 205. Happened to be built near some wetlands. So they put up some subdivisions a little bit of sloshy water in the area. And that house's elevation was such that their lender required them to have flood insurance. Just enough wetlands area to create the need and have to do that. So be aware that it can happen even in the middle of, uh, what is that? What community that is? Uh, Coving I don't know, Covington, whatever that area is. Okay, anything about flood insurance yet? Yes. Uh huh. Why is it? No, 
because an umbrella policy is a liability coverage form. So it's strictly you're responsible for causing bodily injury to someone or damaging their stuff. And it's that additional layer to provide coverage for you. Flood and earthquake is a property policy. So it's covering damage due to a peril, peril being earthquake or flood. So umbrella has no connection to a flood or earthquake. Okay, another famous question I get all the time, earthquake insurance, do I really need it living here? Yes, you do. Um, you should consider it, most definitely, and it is affordable. Um, we live in a Cascadia subduction zone, and there's a fault line in Portland. We're just waiting for when it might come. Nobody can predict a natural disaster. So I'm just giving you this information as a form of information so that you know, you know if you were, were you know, kind of feeling a little ambivalent about it or a little uneasy, well, you can protect yourself by flood insurance or by, pardon me, by earthquake insurance. Um, you see that the um, odds are one in three that there'll be one here in the next 50 years. Again, we established that your homeowner's policy doesn't cover earthquake. So the coverage on earthquake insurance is the same as your homeowner's policy. So much like we talked about the coverage to, for your dwelling, your home, your earthquake policy is gonna match that. You always gotta match the, the dwellings, okay? So you buy your homeowners at 500,000, you gotta buy your earthquake at 500,000 for your structure. The rest of those coverages that we talked about, so detached structures, your personal things, and additional living expense is flexible. You can either choose to reduce it or ex exclude it. So if you wanna buy earthquake insurance, in my opinion, cover the structure because that's the thing I'm most concerned about. I'm not so concerned about what happens to my couch and my clothing as a result of, of an earthquake. Yes, you can cover those things, but my concern is my house moves and all of a sudden I've got to get an engineer out to you know fix, fix that. My house is built in 91, so it's still probably pretty sound. And again, the rate for earthquake insurance is based on the structure that you have. So the rate for earthquake in Portland on a home built in 1910 versus my house built in you know, 1991 in Philida, Salmon Creek is gonna be a different rate because it's a different structure and different mm -hmm. building codes. So know that you know the earthquake policy is flexible and so you can protect yourself with the areas that you're most concerned about. Again, I would counsel on the structure because that's the part that's gonna move and shake. So, um, but be aware of this too. So the flood policy and the other property policies have a static deductible. Um, earthquake insurance, it's a percentage of your coverage limit. So the $500,000 house, if you have a 10% earthquake deductible, much like health insurance, you pay the deductible first and then the insurance company pays the rest of the bill. So if you buy a policy, with a 10% deductible and your dwelling is 500,000, know that you got the first 50 and then you get the rest. And that's the part that causes people to back off and say, well, I don't know if I want to do that. Okay. But know that you can buy a deductible that's a little bit lower. So, you know, I bought a policy for myself finally. It took me a while. I, I mean, I'm an insurance, so it took me a long time before I finally bought Earthquake because we finally had a few things happen. But then we also had a company that came out with a two and a half percent deductible. So you might trade a little bit more in premium dollar, but the likelihood that you're gonna get a benefit as a result of an earthquake for the repairs to be paid mostly by the insurance company rather than you is higher. So you get that concept for the, the two and a half percent deductible, you're gonna pay, going again back to the 500,000, you're gonna pay 12,500 versus that 10% deductible where you're gonna pay 50,000. So know that the earthquake coverage is flexible and, and your insurance advisor can walk you through it and you can see that it actually is affordable. And so, you know, if it causes you any lost sleep, you know, you can get a quote and, and see what it looks like, so. Okay, now we're gonna to get to that part that we <laughs> you probably are all waiting for. The good part. So why are my insurance rates going up? So you can see by this list of things, the things that are causing it to go up. And some of it's a bitter pill to swallow because 
our insurance agency, uh, the insurance industry rates are changing daily and they're changing in regards to what they accept uh, for business is happening rapidly. Today, we learned that another carrier is restricting who they're gonna write new business for to no homeowners claims, no auto claims. It has to be, you know, just fit the parameter of what they're looking for. So think that insurance companies now are just getting more and more and more conservative because they're trying to reduce their risk. So for many years, it was wide open. And if you had claims or you had auto accidents, we could find you a policy. Now, that's not the case. Now I have people calling me and saying, hey, you know, I've, I've got a Kia, I got a Hyundai, um, I need to get auto insurance. I've got a bunch of carriers that have just said, sorry, we're not gonna do that. Those are being stolen so often that we're not gonna cover those anymore. So um, unfortunately, insurance companies, in order to try to restrict writing more new business that they can't control, and I know it sounds odd, but they're trying to reduce their risk. And so, um, as you know, insurance is all a matter of statistics and actuarial data. And so they're trying to restrict that data and control that data. So we've had a lot more additional, you know, a lot of natural disasters um, that have caused significantly more claims to be filed and the cost of those claims has gone up. So part of the reason is the additional natural disasters that happen throughout our country. So what happens in Louisiana affects us here in Washington. You know, what happens here in Washington happens, affects the people in New York. We all share in the cost of our insurance. So it, it's a shared commodity in that regard to rate because it's actual data. So again, in COVID, we've had the increased cost of labor and materials. So um, losses that happened to structures increased and the higher cost of health care. Um, I talked a little bit about auto theft. Did you know that Washington is the third worst state for auto theft? in the United States. You know, and remember recently, like last year, year ago, four pickups were being you know, vandalized you know, or stolen. Um, we had a neighbor who was stolen out of his driveway. Um, Kia's and Hyundai's are being stolen and higher valued cars are now, some carriers are quitting riding higher valued cars. I had a client that wanted to, um, I had talked to him in March he came, I couldn't write it at that time. He came back to me um, in June and I couldn't write it because the company no longer writes higher value cars. He had a Mercedes and the company has decided we're not writing Mercedes or any Lexuses, any high value cars in the state of Washington. This was progressive insurance. So um, companies are just backing off and getting out. I think that they're just having a knee jerk reaction and then we kind of have to wait for all the influx of things happening to shake down. But for now, this is what they've done. Because of the increased claims that they've paid out, they have backed off. And um, the only way that insurance companies can continue to stay and keep their reserves is by raising rates. And insurance companies are required to maintain a reserve and be able to pay future claims. So if they don't have enough to pay future claims, they become insolvent, and then you have nothing. And so that's that's where it comes into play, where they're just getting more conservative in order to um, maintain you know, good clients and try to reduce their losses. Any questions on the rates going up or anything I can answer for you? I don't want to slow you down, but that third worst per capita, trust me that there are more cars stolen in New York City, state of California and Florida, Washington. Well, maybe so they're maybe day. they're one and two. <laughs> okay, yeah, I I cannot tell you the source where I pulled it from, but I know I pulled it from a source recently. Yeah. But yeah, you know, it's it's you know. They did. So they, that's my next point. <laughs> so, yeah. So our insurance commissioner and um, all of us in the insurance industry say that tongue in cheek. Um, he called 
caused quite a bit of a hubbub because um, most insurance rate is based on, you know, the facts of the household. So how old you are, what your credit score is, what kind of cars you drive, what kind of uh, liability limits you carry, do you have tickets or accidents or not? Do you have claims? Um, again, if I said, if I didn't say that, your age, um, occupations, all those factor in to how an insurance company determines rate. And many of them that we work with heavily weigh on the credit score. So if you want to think of a different, different categories for how we're going to rate, they rate really heavy on your credit score. So the best thing that you can do is to guard your credit score. So maintain it, you know, and most of us want to do that, but do understand that it can impact your future insurance rates. So here's an example of how it happens to, you know, responsible folks. You're going to buy a car. And so you start shopping for the, shopping for your auto loan. So you, you get binged each time you're looking, you know, for each different financial institution for a loan. So that's a tick, a tick, a tick, a tick on your credit score. Um, or let's say you're refinancing, you're looking for a new loan on your home, a tick, a tick, a tick, a tick. And then you get your renewal and you're like, you know, if you were with a company that has a really heavily weighted credit score, and if you did a lot of inquiry, okay, I'm not talking about, you know, you do one or two and you're like, I know what bank I want to use and I'm good. That's not going to be a significant, serious event. But um, if you're doing a lot of inquiry, um, a lot of credit look back. Um, whether it's through applying for credit cards, that kind of thing, um, that all can play a factor. So going back, Heidi, to yes, your question, the insurance commissioner took away credit as a matter of rate. And so for a lot of people, that was an immediate increase to their insurance rate. For some people, it helped them, but really for most of the population, um, that impacted their rates. He, didn't, he said it wasn't um, equitable. Everybody should be rated the same. Okay, so then there was a lot of pushback. All the companies made all their rate adjustments. Um, and then it was de deemed that he couldn't do that, that he wasn't allowed to do that without a vote. He couldn't just do that without um, approval. And so it got added back in. So, you know, you might have seen an increase. You might have seen, you're probably seeing all kinds of fluctuations every time you get your renewal. Uh, but it got added back in last year in June. And so now credit scoring is back. Most of the carriers have introduced it back again. So, and that's been a benefit. But then we've got all this other rate structure going on. So it's really hard to put your finger down on one thing and say, this is the cause. Okay. Yeah, Shopping around no. for... Um, so yeah, my counsel would be to you, um, I think it's wise to, to look around every three years or so. Um, some instances when you're a very stable family, very stable individual, you're not going to see a lot of change, um, because your longevity and your history with a current carrier is going to be to your benefit when you look for a new carrier. Um, but there are some factors for certain families, um, certain household compositions, where um, it does make sense to look and it does help, um, particularly if you've introduced teenage drivers or you've got additional aspects in your household. So the factors change, the rating changes by company depending on their loss experience. And so my opinion is, look every three years, you know, check it. An insurance inquiry is not considered a pain on your credit. It's a, it's just looking at your number. We don't see anything about your credit. It's an internal number. So um, don't worry about checking your insurance rate that that's going to damage your credit score. It's not. So we'll go quickly here because i am um, taking up a lot of your time. So consider higher deductibles on auto insurance, 500,000 or $500 at least for comprehensive in collision. Don't go anything lower than that. Drive less. Companies are rating based on how many annual miles you drive. So 
If you said to them, I drive 10,000, but you only drive three, tell them you only drive three because they're all rating based on the amount of time you're on the road. So don't file minor claims. Um, telemetrics is a big thing. This is a way for you to tell the insurance company and show them how you drive. So a lot of people don't like the idea of telemetrics. It's a mobile app based program that you load on your phone, you drive around for 90 days, that app records and knows how you drive your car. So a lot of people say, I don't like Big Brother. I don't want Big Brother. Um, fair, but Big Brother knows all kinds of things about you. Big Brother knows that when I get in my car at one o'clock on Saturday afternoon, that it's two minutes to Fred Meyer. That automatically knows by my pattern that I go to Fred Meyer on Saturday afternoon. Knows when I go to church on Sunday, like Google tells me, I know it's only 11 minutes. You know, so please don't be frightened of the big brother thing because it's out there, but it's really a way for you to say, let me show you how good I drive. For 90 days, put this app on your program. You, get, you can get up to a 30% discount for the lifetime of your policy. I know it sounds, you're like, eh. But you can do it. I made, I made, you can, you can do 90 days. You can do 90 days. And uh, I have some carriers that the worst you can do is 5%. So it's a win-win. Load the app and be on your way, you know, and you'll still get 5% off. But truly, my husband got 20%. He did better than the rest of our family. <laughs> he drives a commercial vehicle. So he drives a dump truck. And so he has to drive, he has to pay attention to, you know, stopping distance and all those things. He can't gun it going up the freeway and he can't hit the freight. Well, he can't hit the brakes hard, but he's attentive to that. But he scored the best of our entire family. I thought I was the best driver in our household, <laughs> you know, but, you know, he was, he was quite proud of himself, you know, because I drive a truck, you know, but yeah, you know, so really telemetrics, I know that, uh, do it, do it, do it because you show the insurance company that you're a good driver. And it does create awareness too, um, because you'll, you will pay attention to how quickly you hit the brake and how much stopping distance you have. Because I live in Santa Creek and you know, you have people go, turning into Fred's and people turning into you know, the mini mart and all that whatnot. And if you're too close, you're hitting the brake. Well, it knows that you hit the brake like that. So I started backing way off, backing way off because discounts are discounts. So the uh, rest of these are pretty common, pay in full, policies with the same company. Some policies or companies are giving a discount if you take electronic documents rather than uh, paper. Uh, membership in AAA, so safe call and mutual VM flaw, give you a discount if you're a member of AAA. You have to do this. 90 days. Once. Once, yeah. Yep, so you get through it once. You know, of course, if you changed your company, like if you went from one carrier to another, then you'd have to do it again. Like, yeah, that could, well, it could impact your rate, but, you know, remember it's, it's an incident in time. And so it's watching how you drive for 90 days. So, you know, I had some bad periods and I imagine my husband did, but it's just one in a whole series of drives, you know, and you can tell the system that you're not driving. You can say, hey, I'm riding with Mary. I'm not driving, you know, and the system allows you to just say, don't ignore that drive. So. After the fact? <laughs> yes. 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 Because I had the app. I'd sit, I'd sit every couple of days on the app and I'd make my husband Pete do it too. I'd say, okay, go through your drives, you know, and tell, you know, if he was riding with Sam or whatever, you know, it's like, go through your drives. And I made my son do it because it helped him, my insurance rate because he's a young driver and he had some challenges. So he had a ticket and an accident on his record. So like you're doing this because our rate's up because of you, you know, so you're doing it. He didn't want to do it. He ignored it, but he got 5% off because they gave him a discount just for letting them collect his data. So, so, so if you, no, you can't delete it. You can't delete it. I mean, you have to be honest. The system lets you, I mean, it's your integrity, you know, so, I mean, I'll, that's what I'll say. It's your integrity. You tell the system if it was your drive or not your drive, right? Because it used to be a plug-in device, and now it's a mobile app for the most part. So um, I, I consider doing it, you know, and talk to your insurance advisor. Every company has a little bit of a different format. 
but it really is a way for you to control it. And it stays with you for the lifetime of the policy. So 90 days, we can all do 90 days. You know. So, okay, homeowner's insurance, increase your deductible. Um, don't file small claims. Quickly what I'll say here is you do have the right to file a claim, but remember now things are very restrictive and conservative. So if you file a thousand dollar claim, you know, and, you, and the company gives you, you know, less your deductible, so you pocket five hundred dollars. Fair, you can do that, but be cautious because if you have that significant water event, you now have two claims on your record, and in nowadays market, two claims, you're going to probably be shopping for a new homeowners insurance policy. So keep it for the big event. Don't use it for small events right now. Save save the small claims. The rest of these are pretty self-explanatory. Smoke detectors get you a discount. Ring devices get you a discount. Carbon monoxide alarms get you a discount. And so do water leaks. Water leak sensors. I don't know if you've heard of these. Um, these are devices that you can attach to your water line. And if it detects a leak in your water line, it shuts your water off. Insurance companies love these devices and they will give you a discount for it. So. You know, there's the initial cost to install or to put it in. And I think you could self-install. It's not complicated, um, but you do get a discount for it. So be aware of that. Okay, so the next material, that's pretty much the meat of my policy. The rest of this is pretty much things you should do in a water claim. And since you're going to get the get the presentation, you, know, you can see yourself. What are the most important things to do? Shut off the water. Call your insurance advisor, call Paul Davis or 1-800-WATER-DAMAGE or Serve Pro. Do it right away. Do it right away. They are the experts and they will um, they will give you a good bead on whether or not you need to file a claim for your homeowner's insurance or if it's something that they can take care of for you quickly. So make sure you remove those wet items from the house. Um, that sounds kind of self-explanatory, but truly get it out. Get it out of the house. Any moisture, you want it gone. And then start the process. So if you've got any fans, get them going. You know, get those going. And the water remediation people will come with really big fans. Um, but that's, that's the best thing that you can do in the event of a water claim. Okay, my takeaways. And then I'm done. Um, this is what I would consider your homework. These are things that I think you should consider. And I think we've talked about some of these. Uh, can't stress enough. Talk to your insurance advisor. They, they are your friend when it comes to coverage. Talk to them once a year. Our agency sends out an email every year to our clients and asks them to complete a survey. And so um, we want to make sure that we know if anything's changed in your household and the questions prompt you and they ask you questions that tell us if something's happened. So um, complete a review with your insurance advisor. Another thing, take an inventory of your home. So many people say, how do I know what, what I have in my house? How do I record this? Um, you know, do I write it all down? Take a video. Take a video, walk through your house, take the time to do that every couple of years or so, or if you do purchase something significant, take a video, store it on the cloud. At least you have some kind of document. It doesn't take too long to walk through your house and get that. So um, protect high valued items. So know that there's uh, limitations on your home policy for loss to jewelry, firearms, and collectibles when the loss is due to theft. So if you've got higher valued jewelry items, either specifically insure them, or store them away. Um, we have too many claims where people have lost a lot of valuables due to theft. And um, unfortunately, they didn't have everything scheduled. So. Can you give a recommendation about So there's two ways you can do it. And so if you're like, hey, I got about 10, 15,000 of stuff, you know, the things that you wear all the time, you know, the things that are important to you, I schedule. You know, because something I wear all the time, I could knock out, you know, a stone or something like that. So those items, if you wear them all the time and they're important to you, schedule them. Um, typically, the rate is like a dollar, dollar fifteen per hundred of coverage. Okay. But if you have a lot of miscellaneous items, like I collected a lot of things when my mother passed away, and I got all her jewelry, and so she had a lot of miscellaneous pieces. Not anything really all large, but collectively probably 10 or 15,000. You can blanket your jewelry. That's a, a different rate. But that way, at least if somebody has, does happen to break into your house and they swipe your stuff, you get something instead of nothing. 
And so blanketing your jewelry. So again, as you're saying, I'm not gonna itemize everything. I'm just gonna put it all in, in one bucket limit so that I have coverage. And thankfully they're not going to, the insurance company's not gonna say, prove to me you had a, you know, a pearl necklace. They're not that punitive. You know, you have blanket jewelry and you say, hey, I had inherited a, they're generally the benevolent in that regard and they're gonna cover that claim. Okay. Nope. You can you can do things like firearms, you can do comic book collections, art, you can you can you can pretty much ensure anything of that regard. Firearms. What did you say, Mom? Musical instruments. Yes. If you've got something like so we have folks with um, clarinets and um, those kind of, you know, carry it around to school when they're going to music class and you bonk the bonk the instrument. So or we had a come some guy who's a guitar, he played bass guitar in a band. And so he had a lot of nice guitars that he would take and every time he'd go play at the band, you know, he was risking the damage of these uh, musical equipment. If you use it in your trade, there's a little bit of a difference, but this was a hobby for him to play in a band. So you can specifically schedule almost anything. Okay, um, get an online account with your insurance company. It's really helpful. Um, allows you to pull an ID card, allows you to look at your policy, allows you to file a claim. Yes, use your insurance agent for these kind of things. But if it's eight o'clock at night and you're just curious and you want to look at something, um, I'm probably not available. So, you know, let you look online. And then if you do the telemetrics, you already got an online account because you kind of have, you have to have one to do the telemetrics. So do learn how to turn off your water. Uh, maybe not so much the gas and the electricity. I don't know how to do that, but I do know how to turn off my water. Um, that's key. Um, and then uh, replace your washing machine hoses every year. If you've got the rubber ones, at least once a year. Um, I used to have rubber ones and I now have stainless steel ones. And there's a reason for that. So that happens very quickly and very suddenly and the hot water is hot. And so do that $30 a year and you've got it taken care of. Okay, and that is where I'm gonna end. I have talked far too long and I apologize, but I have a lot of material and I didn't know how to how to reduce it down, but I do appreciate your participation. Yeah. 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 Is it a fly fraud state? If I get into an accident in Oregon and California, and then more importantly, what if I'm out of the country? Let's see how that like that. Yeah, out of the country, no. Nope, nope. The country. Canada and the United States, and you're a resident of the United States, yes, you're covered wherever you drive in Canada and the United States. And when I'm in sure don't worry about it. You can worry about it. I would worry about it. Okay. So, yeah, you know, your auto policy does respond when you rent a car on vacation. So, your auto policy is going to treat your car as if it was a substitute vehicle. So, you got coverage. All right. But here's the thing that happens, you know, um, something happens and there is a claim on the car and it's sitting there and it's not getting taken care of, um, or the rental car company is being a little picky and they're kind of making things complicated. It can get sticky and it can get annoying. So if you go to Hawaii, just, just buy the insurance, you know, enjoy your vacation and buy the insurance so you can turn in your car in a crumple and there's, you know, <laughs> Do it. I mean, yes, you have coverage and you have the right to choose which way you want to go. But if you're going to Hawaii, I would do it. If you go to Mexico, of course, you have to buy their insurance. Going to Europe, also um, buy the insurance in a foreign country because it could hold you there while the claim is open. And so it's just easier to buy the coverage and spend a little more. It's just considered the cost of vacation. But it's your decision. Your Great decision. presentation. I have lots of questions for my insurance. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a there's a deck of cards on the table, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. No, no pressure. I'm just here to answer questions. And I, I want to be an educator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.